If you were to do a Mount Rushmore, the Covenant Presbyterian Church, there would have to be the profile or the, the bust of Beverly St. John as a part of that. A daughter, a wife, a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother, a leader, a teacher, a Christian, a Cumberland Presbyterian, and a child of God. These and many more things could be said to describe Beverly St. John. The way I would describe Beverly is she is your number one supporter. If you're working in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, if it has anything to do with the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, she is a supporter. She is a cheerleader. She is unconditionally behind you all the way, and that is an amazing um, thing to have in a congregation. Well, as I look back over the years, I can't help but think about my uh, maternal, paternal grandparents. They were not Christians. They were agnostics, and uh, they didn't mind anybody else, but they just uh, were not interested in church. So I thought it was interesting that my father, he was one of four children, and uh, he was not involved in the church either. They had four children. And, uh, but uh, some friends of his, teenage friends of his, invited him to go to church with them one time. And he did, and he liked it. And so he joined a Baptist church with his friends and never looked back. He became a uh, deacon in his Baptist church and a Sunday school teacher and was always faithful. So I, I learned so much more about the church and my involvement with the church because my parents set such a good example for me. So um, we had prayer every morning at breakfast time and uh, never missed going to church. And uh, I learned a lot of good, important things about uh, regular attendance, being on time, studying my Sunday school lesson, and uh, having an offering. And my father even uh, taught a men's Bible class for many years until his death, really. And um, my mother just taught the ladies' Bible class, and uh, daddy even played his violin in some of the worship services. And uh, that was so special to me. And so their involvement with the church set a good example for me and um, I think the Baptist Church used to have what they call the six-part system of uh, coming to church, being on time, bringing your offering, reading your Bible, stand for worship, and making an offering and things like that. So that was a good pattern for me to start to church with when I was a child. So I'm very grateful for our family and the good things that they did to show us the way, and I've always been grateful for, for both of my parents. I did not know my maternal grandparents, I did know my, my maternal grandmother, and I can remember as a little girl sitting on her lap and she'd sing, bring it in the sheaves, bring it in the sheaves, because I thought she was saying bring it in the sheep. <laughs> but that's my memory of my grandmother, and uh, she died at a very young age but um, I do have good memories of her. <clears throat> well, I'll have to say first that I met a man uh, named Bill St. John, and uh, I didn't know a thing about the common Presbyterian in church except when I was a teenager, uh, I went home with a friend in the afternoon to wait until my father could pick me up to go home in the evening. And uh, Mrs. Moss was a member of the Common Presbyterian Church. And I was always a nice 
courteous little girl, and she'd sit me on a um, stool in her kitchen while she was fixing dinner, and uh, she'd tell me about going to Presbytery and about Gam Sing Kwa and Makadu Gam and uh, Jose Fajardo and all of that family, and I was very fascinated, but um, that was my introduction actually to the Cumberland Presbyterian Church was through the mother of a friend of mine. And then many years later, a relative of hers moved to Nashville, and um, his name was Bill St. John, mm -hmm. and he was down on his knees freezing a freezer of ice cream for us to take with us on a picnic, and we invited him to go, but he had just moved and needed to find a place to live. And uh, so later on, we got him a date, and he went, went out uh, with a group of us for dinner and dancing. And um, he finally got around to dancing with me, and uh, he said, ooh, you're a good dancer. We gotta do this again sometime. So that was my introduction to Bill St. John, never knowing that a year after that, we'd be married. and. Mm -hmm getting ready to go into the Army, actually the Air Force. So um, we were married for over 50 years and had a, a good life. But he was active in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, so thereby hangs a tale. My children uh, were baptized not too long after we joined the, I joined the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And um, they became very active and Grew up and did all the same things that I'd always done, going to Sunday school and church and participating in the youth groups and things like that. So we had a good, wholesome life uh, going to church and enjoying our church friends. After we were married, we went into the um, Air Force in Meridian, Mississippi. And we were just a block from a church. It happened to be a Baptist church because we didn't have a car. So that's why we went to church for three years during the World War II. And um, we never talked about him joining the Baptist church and me joining the Cumberland Presbyterian Church uh, until after the war. And we had come home had one little girl and another one on the way. And uh, we knew that we needed to settle down and decide where we were going to church. And so he said, Beverly, I don't mind the Baptist church. In fact, <laughs> he appreciated it because the Baptist church in Meridian, Mississippi gave me a job for three years as the youth director and a youth choir and church visitor. So uh, he was involved with the Baptist church when I was. And uh, in fact, everybody else thought he was a member. But so the time came and we had to make a decision. And uh, he said, Beverly, I don't mind being baptized, but that to me would uh, trivialize my baptism as an infant. And he said, that meant a lot to me. I said, Bill, if your baptism means that much to you, I can accept your baptism and be happy in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. So the very next Sunday, I joined the Addison Avenue Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And um, uh, Jan was the baby, and you no, know, Susan was about two years old, and Jan was a baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had them baptized soon after I joined. So we've been happy Cumberland Presbyterians ever since. Mm -hmm. Great. I learned to love her by being involved. And I guess I would have been happy in most any church if I had gotten involved. So, But what I love about the Covenant Presbyterian Church is I have come to know her, is her um, openness, her willingness to accept other, other points of view, uh, and to grow along uh, with uh, being involved with uh, social projects and uh, that's something the Baptist Church was not involved in. And uh, so uh, their openness, 
to other denominations and cooperation with other denominations and uh, uh, her willingness to, to grow and, and learn. And uh, everybody I've known in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church has been very supportive of her doctrine and uh, her traditions. And uh, in fact, that's one thing I like about the church is because it's a fairly contemporary church compared to some of the other denominations. And uh, came into being in 1810. And I love her history. I belong to the Brent Haven Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Uh, <clears throat> it at one time was two separate churches. And um, because of neighborhood ch changes and things like that, we decided to uh, unite with a uh, church in Brentwood. We were the Brookhaven Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and there was the Brentwood Church, so we decided that it would be to the best interest of both congregations to become one body. And I am so proud of what they have accomplished in these few years since they became one, did not one church. And um, so it's been a successful merger and I wish other churches could sort of doing the same thing. But the uh, Brent Haven Church is a tradition, traditional in many ways and yet very contemporary in other words. Well, I was raised in the Cumberland Presbyterian denomination, and uh, all through my life, my parents were very involved in uh, the de denomination, both locally and statewide and all. And so through the years, I even attended General Assembly and uh, the women's programs. And through the years, I always heard my mother speak of Beverly St. John, or heard the name. So, uh, in 1967, uh, Ronnie and I moved to Nashville with a three-month-old baby, and the first phone call we got was from Beverly St. John. And, of course, Mother was there, and Mother was delighted to hear from Beverly. And Beverly was calling. Somehow or another, she found out that we uh, had, were moving or had moved to Nashville. So she was calling to invite us, Ronnie and I, to a new Sunday school class that was being organized. It was for young adults. So Ronnie and I thought, well, that'll be fun. We'll, you know, go and see. Well, that was just the beginning of a Sunday school class that lasted for years. And Beverly was our leader. She was our mentor. She was our teacher. Uh, she saw many of us uh, through uh, the birth of our children, our grandchildren, and many things. And Beverly, as everyone knows, is very original and came up with many, many ideas for fun parties that we have. Um, we have some pictures of times long, long ago. And I'll never forget uh, one time Beverly said, well, let's have a bowling party. And I thought, well, that's one thing that Beverly can't do. Well. She can bowl, no matter what. There's something, there's, I don't think there's a thing that Beverly St. John cannot do. But uh, anyway, she has guided us through many years, young couples, and uh, of course continues to do that. And uh, we just uh, all have loved her through the years. I'm a newer member uh, to the Brent Haven family. And, uh, from the very first day that I came here uh, for church, one of the first people that came over and introduced herself was Beverly St. John. And it has been such a pleasure knowing her. And one of the most surprising things is, I have a cousin that goes to the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Lexington, Tennessee. And when I was mentioning that I had joined here, the first thing she asked me have you met Beverly St. John? Everyone at her church is very much from, especially the women, because I've now been to her church and they all ask me about Beverly. Um, I really didn't know at the time 
what a legend she is um, in the whole Cumberland Presbyterian faith, not just this church. And it has been such a joy to get to know her. She has reached out to me. Um, she has talked to me about the history of Cumberland Presbyterian. She knows it better than anybody else I have ever met. But it's her loving spirit of how she reaches out to everyone. I have seen her do that with people that have joined since me. And she's just, she's there for all of us. And she is such a big part of our church and the whole faith of Cumberland Presbyterians. In 1977, Beverly St. John was nominated for moderator of the General Assembly, and although she was not elected then, 10 years later, on February 22, 1988, Marjorie Black and Van Lynch recommended her for nomination again, and this time history was made as Beverly St. John was elected to and accepted the call to be the first female moderator of the General Assembly of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Well, I guess so. I don't know how, to me it's very remarkable, and I don't know how in the world I arrived at that position, but I had gotten involved with the various programs of the denomination and had become well known through speaking engagements and being on various committees and things like that. So, I don't know, somebody just decided to nominate me and I was nominated twice. First in 1977, and uh, there were four of us nominated, and I came in second. And then uh, exactly 11 years later, 1988, I was nominated again, but I was the only nominee that year. <laughs> so, so I was lucky I didn't have to campaign <laughs> or do anything like that, so it was certainly an honor. And uh, I was excited and appreciated it so much that I was being honored in such a way. But uh, it's not all just honor, it's, there's a job to it. I guess primarily public relations, trying to be, represent the denomination uh, with my best foot forward and being gracious and kind and loving of people. And so I really enjoyed that year of visiting and speaking at different meetings and traveling and so I was quite honored and grateful for that opportunity. We were a part of the team that rewrote our Confession of Faith in 1984. That must have been a very rewarding and, and rich experience. It was like getting a seminary education. Mm -hmm. I think there were about 20 people on that committee and all of them, except me, me were uh, seminary graduates, professors, and uh, ministers. And uh, so I learned so much about our theme, I mean, our beliefs and confession of faith by being on that committee. So I, I was all ears and learned everything I could. And that was an exciting experience and so beneficial to me. And I was the only woman for a while. But then they made a rule that if anyone resigned, they would be replaced with a woman. So I think we ended up with several other women on that committee. But that was four good years of theological, theological education. Were, were four years is how long it took? I think it was three or four years, I've forgotten. Okay. I think we might, have, we might have gotten a little ahead of the game, I'm not sure, but it was a great experience for all of us. That, um, Roy Blakeburn was the chairman of the committee, and he kept us always focused on um, the theme and the importance of uh, what we were doing, and uh, always kept us on track. And I appreciated that very much. He was a good, good committee chairman. How did it feel when you guys were done? How did it feel what? When you were completed, when you had completed your well, task. we all breathed a sigh of relief, but the interesting thing is uh, we were going to produce, uh, introduce it to the General Assembly to have its approval. And they asked me if I would write a 
song that would reflect those beliefs. And I did, and it still, I guess we're still singing that, I don't know. God, Creator and Redeemer, praise to Christ, God's human Son. Praise to Spirit, holy and unchanging, ever free and ever one. God, eternal justice, mercy, wooing people to respond, wooing people to before learning a little about the Cumberland Presbyterian Church when my friend's mother talked to me about the missionaries because she was always so excited when Gam St. Croix or Makudu Gam or somebody like that came to the States. And then uh, uh, right after I joined the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, I started going to the Missionary Auxiliary Meeting. In those days, it was called the Missionary Society or the Missionary Auxiliary. And uh, we had programs every month on some aspect of denominational missions. And then I had the opportunity to go to uh, South America and uh, speak to the ladies there for, at a retreat. And I was there for about uh, two weeks and got very much more intimate with the missionaries and our mission work there. And of course, through our various programs, I learned more about our work in Hong Kong and Japan and uh, South America, and uh, also about our Choctaw Indians that at one time were under the care of the Board of Missions. And uh, so getting to travel and speak and learn about our various mission programs was one another 
wonderful means of education about the denomination and our various programs. So uh, uh, I've been so blessed that way. And then, of course, I, being on the Board of Missions, it was first the Board of Foreign Missions. And then uh, we were realigned, so we wanted to draw the whole denomination into the work of missions, not just the women. And uh, so the, uh, we decided to have uh, one Board of Missions with four divisions. One was World Missions, one was Home Ministries, one was uh, Missionary Education, and the other was the de Department of Women's Work. So we didn't take uh, missions away from the women, but gave them responsibility for the whole denomination, not just missionaries, missionary work. And uh, so that has been very wholesome and good for the church, I think. And at uh, the same time, we gave the women the responsibility of learning about the other denominational programs, and uh, Christian education, the children's home, and seminary, and various things like that. So the women have grown considerably when we were given that opportunity. And now they're not just missionary ladies, but come on to return. And uh, I'm so grateful for that. We've made progress along that way with an understanding of missions. And uh, we've all grown in that process. But I love going to Japan and Hong Kong and Colombia. I've been to Colombia twice. Lost my bags one time, so I lived in, in, in uh, Columbia for two weeks with borrowed clothes. I was so thrilled to be offered the position of Director of Women's Work after uh, we, the various boards worked together and uh, we had a division of women's work for the Board of Missions. And uh, that was not a job description, and uh, I asked the president of the Board of Missions what I was supposed to do. And he said, you'll just have to work it out. So I sat down and gave some thought to what I'd like to see Cumberland Presbyterian women doing in the next few years. And first thing was that I wanted them to stand up and be counted and accept positions of leadership as elders, deacons, and stated clerks, and ordained ministry. The second dream I had for them was that they become more aware of what other denominations were doing and get involved with Church Women United and work with uh, women in other churches. And uh, then the third thing that I wanted them to do was to become more aware of the denominational programs. They had focused on nothing but missions for so many years. And I think they were going to be very surprised in, uh, in a good sort of way about the work of the other boards and agencies of the denomination. My first point. memory of Beverly St. John was at General Assembly when I was a teenager and started hearing her name mentioned. And then I remember her walking in to a General Assembly meeting in a beautiful red suit. And it was like everybody immediately turned to her for leadership. And I was so impressed by that as a female. I hadn't seen that many uh, females in that kind of role where they were so richly respected. And um, her um, leadership was about love and grace. It wasn't about, I have arrived. It was, I'm here to serve. And um, so that was my first memories of her. And I think that's um, it's even a richer memory for me now that she's my friend that I can go to and um, talk to about anything and everything. Um, I feel blessed to have had all of those experiences with Beverly. The fourth thing I wanted them to do was to become more socially active in their communities. They had been involved in their church with feeding the uh, hungry people and uh, visiting the sick, but they had not reached out into their communities and get involved there. So those were the four things I wanted to see them to do. So I was given an executive committee to work with who would be uh, in charge of the convention programs. And uh, we got off to a wonderful start and women were so accepting and interested in doing more things. And I was grateful for that. So I spent 11 years working with Cumberland Christian women, doing programs for their presbyteries and synods, 
in Presbyterian uh, in their programs for their conventions, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And all of the women that I worked with were just outstanding, and I was very grateful for all the help that they gave me in planning their programs for those various uh, times of the year. Uh, um, I will say that by the time I retired, retired 11 years later, I think every church in the denomination had women elders and deacons, and I was so grateful for that. They were also involved with social ministries and active in Church Women United, and uh, for that I was very grateful. Uh, speaking of Church Women United, <clears throat> there was one group of women that very opposed to Church Women United, but as God would have it, a few years later, those that were opposed to Church Women United were either a state president or a local president or actively involved, and so I'm glad they changed their minds. I remember one time at a convention, somebody, uh, I had invited a lady from United Presbyterian Church to be our guest speaker, and somebody got up after that meeting was over and said, why do we have to have outsiders when we have so many speakers in our own church? And um, I remember my reply was, well, in the Christian church, there are no outsiders. <laughs> and I still believe that to this day. Another little anecdote I'd like to say about Church Women United. I had a call one time from Dorothy Wagner, who was the uh, uh, head of Church Women United at the New York office. She called me and said, Beverly, I've got 10 women coming to Nashville who have been involved with planning the World Day of Prayer in Mexico. And uh, they are coming to Nashville for a little bit of R&R &R and, and then go to a meeting uh, on Monday at uh, Whiteman Chapel. And I said, well, I'll see what I could do. So I made lots of calls and I finally found homes for seven of those ten women that were coming to spend the weekend. And uh, so on Thursday night, I decided I would keep the rest even though I was going to have to go out of town on Friday. But they got in town on Thursday night, and it was late, and they were tired, so I sent them to their bed, bedrooms. And uh, the next morning, I got up and fixed them. Good old southern breakfast of biscuits and ham and grits and uh, things like that. <laughs> and uh, they came to the table, and I put my big table down to a little round table for four ladies. And before we had our blessing, I decided I'd take time to get acquainted with them. And um, the lady to my right was Lucy Kasakendo from Uganda. And she was an Episcopalian. The lady across from me was Una Matthews, who was a United Methodist. And the one on my right was uh, Mona Wong from Singapore. And she was a Presbyterian. So I was so glad to find out that they were all from different churches. And I suddenly realized that they, around my little dining room table were four denominations, four nationalities, uh, four colors, and uh, four different church denominations. And uh, so we sang, joined hands and sang, In Christ There Is No East or West. And that was a wonderful day for me. And I think they enjoyed it too. Now what else do you want me to talk about? In about 1990, uh, I accepted a position on the Theology and Social Concerns Committee of National Presbytery. So when I went to the first meeting, we were sitting around talking and I said, um, I was the new kid on the block and I said, well, do you all have any plans of something we need to be doing? And nobody had anything to say. So I said, well, had you all ever thought about working with Habitat for Humanity? No, how do we go about that? I said, well, I don't know, but I'll find out. So I made a phone call to the office here, and they put me in touch with a young man by the name of Rick Beach. Rick came and met us and told us how we'd go about doing everything. And uh, they liked him, and uh, they, as a, we as a committee decided we proposed this proposition to uh, National Presbytery at our next meeting and suggest that we build a church. So uh, I took risk to that meeting too, and so uh, 
after our discussion of the project possibility, uh, they vote to vote to have National Predator Day build our habitat house. And, uh, oh, I have a picture, the first one that we built. It was in the Clarksville area, and uh, everybody joined in and had such a great time that they decided they'd put the, a, a certain $10,000, I believe, in the presidential budget and build one every year. And, as far as, and they did, and as far as I know, they're still building houses. And I'm very grateful for that. And you've just got to jump in and do things whether you know anything about it or not. <laughs> I guess I have a habit of doing that. One of the positions that I was invited to participate in was in the Unification Committee. Now, soon after I joined the Commonwealth Presbyterian Church, I went to a meeting of the General Assembly, and uh, they had already voted to uh, unite. And we were going to have a uh, the Lord's Supper together at the General Assembly meeting, I believe it was in Paducah, Kentucky. And um, I think Carl Ramsey, was the chairman of the Unification Committee at that time. and um, But when we went to have the vote of the General Assembly followed by the communion service, it was turned down. And I know Carl was so disappointed. And uh, so I think after that, they decided to hold off for a little while. And then the General Assembly named a uh, cooperative work committee to see if we could work together and uh, do some things together. And I think it was that was when the some of the boards started working together. I think it was the Board of Christian Education. Don't know about the other boards. But anyway, so things began to happen along that line and the uh, Cooperative Work Committee started doing things together and uh, made a proposal at the one of the General Assemblies. I should have looked that up. But anyway, it was turned down every year. And one year we decided to have, our committee decided to have a, a celebration of unity. And it was in um, Huntsville, Alabama, and very successful, and about an equal number of blacks and whites, and uh, had a wonderful time. And I got a minister from the First Baptist Church of Nashville, Tennessee, from the black church. And he came as our speaker. He was very well known and a very good speaker. And uh, we had an excellent meeting, and so when we, our committee met again, we were all excited about the possibility, and made another proposal to the General Assembly, and it was turned down. And uh, so this committee kept on, I think, it was for 20, 20 years, that uh, we continued to meet and make some decisions and about various things and try to work toward that end of goal. We even had another celebration of unity, and I believe that was in Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, we always have such a good time at those meetings that the committee would get to be very hopeful that something's going to happen at the next General Assembly. But anyway, we got turned down so many times until uh, just a few years ago, uh, the General Assemblies agreed to unite. and. Uh, at I think the final decision was made at last year's General Assembly, and uh, they gave me the honor of making the making the motion to accept the recommendations. But the um, moderator called a, for a recess, and so I didn't get to do it. But anyway, I'm very happy that that has finally taken place. But it's been many years. And I can understand the reasons why uh, there was so much hesitation. The difference in cultures, difference in traditions, the difference in uh, language in a lot of ways, um, the different kinds of programs, the different ways of singing, uh, all of those things in it to the hesitancy uh, to unite. But I think through uh, thinking and praying, we came to recognize that all of us are God's children, 
and we need to work together to make a difference in the kingdom of God. So I think it's going to be a, a very successful venture if we all work together and quit thinking about our differences and thinking more about our life. Now I wanted to see something happen. Now that we have been voted to be one church, we've got to do a lot of hard work and make it come to pass. But I think there's enough love uh, between those of us who know each other to continue to work on it. And I'm hoping that, oh, certainly within three years we could be one denomination with one General Assembly and all of our committees, just one committee of each phase of work. Well, and recently we were down in Huntsville and one of the members of the church, of, of one of the CPA churches actually came up and asked how she was. And it was reminding me of the role that she played in the first attempt at unification and the stories that she would tell about that. But I was reminded recently of a story she told me about what had happened right after the um, assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And the her being, after being in Memphis, she had, she had gone somewhere for a meeting and someone had come to, she had ordered room service and um, a young African-American man had come to the door. She had been sitting there on the edge of the bed watching the news when she went to the door and as he pushed the food in, she said, she looked up at him with tears in her eyes and just said, I'm so sorry, and they embraced. And to hear her tell that story as if it was yesterday, her, uh, it, was, it was a powerful moment to hear her talk about that and the joy that she know, that I know she's feeling right now that we're in this midst of possibly going back to where she was so, so long ago. It's, a, it's kind of a gift to get to experience that so I'm sure there are a lot of ministers out there who are really probably pretty jealous. And I'm fine with that. <laughs> Can you tell me the story, Beverly, about when you were in Memphis when Martin Luther King was assassinated? I had just gotten to my motel room, turned on the television, and the announcement came on TV that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And I had just placed a call downstairs for them to bring me a, some vegetable soup for my supper. And uh, that's when I heard the announcement. And when the young man came to the door with my bowl, bowl of soup, I couldn't think of what to say, except he put the tray down and I looked at him and said, I'm so sorry and we hugged each other and cried. The day, next day I had to go to a meeting with the Presbytery somewhere, and I got there. And they knew I had just come from Memphis, and I was hurt when the man outside the church was standing around and talking, well, he, he got what was coming to him, and everywhere he went, he stirred up trouble. And uh, they mentioned those things to me. And then I had to go to the church and do a devotional about the love of God. I guess that was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I still don't like to think about it. But we have finally become more accepting and I think we will be able to be a much stronger church. And that comes to pass. Not just the motion being adopted, but for it actually of course, actually to love each other and learn to work together as one denomination. The biggest surprise of my life, and surely the biggest honor bestowed upon me in this church was when Jay Brown called me and said their board of directors was recommending that the seminary give me the first honorary doctorate from Memphis Theological Seminary. I still don't believe it, but it was certainly an honor and an exciting experience. My daughter and a couple of friends went with me for the occasion, and uh, I was so 
feeling so unworthy, it was hard for me to accept. Before this video is done, I'd like to take this opportunity to express to my beloved Cumberland Presbyterian Church my great appreciation for the many opportunities of service that they have, she has given me, and I'm very grateful and always will be. In fact, I'd like to say thank you to the Board of Christian Education who, through, through Miss Virginia Malcolm, asked me to do some writing. I was invited to write a little article for parents of small children, and I told Miss Malcolm, I'm an artist, I'm not a writer. But she kept insisting, and so I started writing, and over a period of six years, I wrote 70 articles for the Board of Christian Education for those little leaflets called My Baby and His Church. And ended up, they compiled uh, 23 of those articles into a little book as the twig has been. So it was Miss Virginia Malcolm and the Board of Christian Education that enabled me to learn how to write. And I'm so grateful. And I've had a wonderful time and appreciated every minute of my experiences in the, my beloved Cumberland Presbyterian Church that I'll love for, forever and ever. Being a Cumberland Presbyterian is just like being a Christian. It's learning to love everybody and respect other people, their opinions, their ideas, to learn from each other and to join hands and work together as the people of God, regardless of the name of our denomination. It's, the bottom line is just love and willingness to accept one another. And finally, Beverly, is there anything else you would like for us to know about or hear from you? Well, I'd like them to know that I've enjoyed my years as a Cumberland Presbyterian active in my church, and I can't think of any, any place I'd rather be than in my church. That's home. Church is home. Church is love. Church is friendship. Church is joy.